The Foundations section contains seven chapters that introduce some essential concepts, information, and skills you will need as an emergency medical technician (EMT). Chapter one overviews emergency medical services and the healthcare system that you will be part of as an emergency medical technician. Chapter two emphasizes that your own safety and well-being are always your first concern. You can't help your patients if you yourself become a patient. Chapter three explains techniques for lifting and moving without injuring yourself or your patient. Chapter four discusses legal and ethical issues that you will face as part of your career, such as "Can I get sued?" and "What is the right thing to do?" Since most people begin EMT training with little medical knowledge or understanding of medical terminology, Chapter Five provides basic information about how medical terms are constructed and about the structure, anatomy, and function, physiology of the human body. Chapter Six introduces principles of pathophysiology, that is, how illness and injury affect the body's function, with emphasis on the cardiovascular and other systems of the body. Finally, Chapter Seven concerns lifespan development, the physiological and psychosocial patterns common to patients you will encounter in the various age groups from infancy through older adulthood. Section One, Foundations. Chapter One, Introduction to Emergency Medical Care. Chapter Two, The Well-Being of the EMT. Chapter Three, Lifting and Moving Patients. Chapter Four, Medical, Legal, and Ethical Issues. Chapter Five, Medical Terminology and Anatomy and Physiology. Chapter Six, Principles of Pathophysiology. Chapter Seven. Lifespan development. Chapter one: Introduction to emergency medical care. Standard, preparatory, EMS systems, research, public health. Competency applies fundamental knowledge of the EMS system, safety, well-being of the EMT, medical, legal, and ethical issues of the provision of emergency care. Core concepts. The chain of human resources that forms the EMS system, how the public activates the EMS system, your roles and responsibilities as an EMT, the process of EMS quality improvement (QI). Objectives. After reading this chapter, you should be able to 1.1 define key terms introduced in this chapter. 1.2. Give an overview of the historical events leading to the development of modern emergency medical services (EMS), pages five through seven. One point three: Describe the importance of each of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration standards for assessing EMS systems, pages six through seven. One point four: Describe the components of an EMS system that must be in place for a patient to receive emergency medical care, pages seven through eighteen. One point five: Compare and contrast the training and responsibilities of EMRs, EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics, pages eight through nine. One point six: Explain each of the specific areas of responsibility for the EMT, page ten. One point seven, give examples of the physical and personality traits that are desirable for EMTs, pages eleven through twelve. One point eight, describe various job settings that may be available to EMTs, page twelve. One point nine, describe the purpose of the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, page thirteen. One point ten. Explain the purpose of quality improvement programs in EMS programs, pages thirteen through fifteen. One point eleven. Explain EMT's role in the quality improvement process, pages fourteen through fifteen. One point twelve. Explain medical direction as it relates to EMS systems, pages fifteen through sixteen. One point thirteen. List ways in which research may influence EMT practice. Pages sixteen through seventeen, one point fourteen. Give examples of how EMS providers can play a role in public health. 
pages 17 through 18. 1.15. Given scenarios, decide how an EMT may demonstrate professional behavior. Pages 10 through 12. Key terms. Designated agent. Page 16. Evidence-based. Page 16. Medical direction. Page 15. Medical director. Page 15. 911 system. Page 8. Patient outcomes. Page 16. Protocols. Page 15. Quality improvement. Page 13. Standing orders. Page 16. When a person is injured or becomes ill, it rarely happens in a hospital with doctors and nurses standing by. In fact, some time usually passes between the onset of the injury or illness and the patient's arrival at the hospital, time in which the patient's condition may deteriorate, time in which the patient may even die. The modern emergency medical services, EMS system, has been developed to provide what is known as pre-hospital or out-of-hospital care. Its purpose is to get trained personnel to the patient as quickly as possible and to provide emergency care on the scene, en route to the hospital and at the hospital until care is assumed by the hospital staff. The emergency medical technician, EMT, is a key member of the EMS team. As you begin to study for a career as an EMT, you will want to answer some basic questions, such as, what is the EMS system? How did it develop? And what will be your role in the system? This chapter will help you begin to answer these questions. The Emergency Medical Services System How It Began In the 1790s, the French began to transport wounded soldiers away from the scene of battle so they could be cared for by physicians. This is the earliest documented emergency medical service. However, no medical care was provided for the wounded on the battlefield. The idea was simply to carry the victim from the scene to a place where medical care was available. Other wars inspired similar emergency services. For example, during the American Civil War, Clara Barton began such a service for the wounded and later helped establish the American Red Cross. During World War I, many volunteers joined Battlefield Ambulance Corps. And during the Korean conflict and the Vietnam War, medical teams produced further advances in field care, many of which led to advances in the civilian sector, including specialized emergency medical centers devoted to the treatment of trauma injuries. Non-military ambulance services began in some major American cities in the early 1900s, again as transport services only, offering little or no emergency care. Smaller communities did not develop ambulance services until the late 1940s, after World War II. Often the local undertaker provided a hearse for ambulance transport. In locations where emergency care was offered along with transport to the hospital, the fire service often was the responsible agency. The importance of providing hospital-quality care at the emergency scene, that is, beginning care at the scene and continuing it uninterrupted during transport to the hospital, soon became apparent. The need to organize systems for such emergency pre-hospital care and to train personnel to provide it also was recognized. EMS Today During the 1960s, the development of the modern EMS system began. In 1966, the National Highway Safety Act charged the United States Department of Transportation, DOT, with developing EMS standards and assisting the states to upgrade the quality of their pre-hospital emergency care. Most EMT courses today are based on models developed by the DOT. In 1970, the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians was founded to establish professional standards. In 1973, Congress passed the National Emergency Medical Services Systems Act as the cornerstone of a federal effort to implement and improve EMS systems across the United States. Since then, the states have gained more control over their EMS systems, although the federal government continues to provide guidance and support. For example, 
the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, Technical Assistance Program has established an assessment program with a set of standards for EMS systems. The categories and standards set forth by the NHTSA, summarized in the following list, will be discussed in more detail throughout this chapter and the rest of this textbook. Regulation and Policy Each state EMS system must have in place enabling legislation, laws that allow the system to exist, a lead EMS agency, a funding mechanism, regulations, policies, and procedures. Resource Management there must be centralized coordination of resources so that all victims of trauma or medical emergencies have equal access to basic emergency care and transport by certified personnel in a licensed and equipped ambulance to an appropriate facility. Human resources and training. At a minimum, all those transporting pre-hospital personnel, those who ride the ambulances, should be trained to the EMT level using a standardized curriculum taught by qualified instructors. Transportation. Safe, reliable ambulance transportation is a critical component. Most patients can be effectively transported by ground ambulances. Other patients require rapid transportation or transportation from remote areas by helicopter or airplane. Facilities. The seriously ill or injured patient must be delivered in a timely manner to the closest appropriate facility. Communications. There must be an effective communication system, beginning with the Universal System Access Number 911, dispatch to ambulance, ambulance to ambulance, ambulance to hospital, and hospital to hospital communications. Public Information and Education. EMS personnel may participate in efforts to educate the public about their role in the system, their ability to access the system, and prevention of injuries. Medical Direction Each EMS system must have a physician as a medical director accountable for the activities of EMS personnel within that system. The medical director delegates medical practice to non-physician providers, such as EMTs, and must be involved in all aspects of the patient care system. Trauma Systems In each state, enabling legislation must exist to develop a trauma system, including one or more trauma centers, triage, and transfer guidelines for trauma patients, rehabilitation programs, data collection, mandatory autopsies, examination of bodies to determine cause of death, and means for managing and ensuring the quality of the system. Where else can you work with great people, have fun, and make a difference? Welcome to EMS. Evaluation. Each state must have a program for evaluating and improving the effectiveness of the EMS system, known as a Quality Improvement, QI, program, a Quality Assurance, QA program, or Total Quality Management, TQM. With the development of the modern EMS system, the concept of ambulance service as a means merely for transporting the sick and injured passed into oblivion. No longer could ambulance personnel be viewed as people with little more than the strength to lift a patient into and out of an ambulance. The hospital emergency department was extended through the EMS system to reach the sick and injured at the emergency scene. Victims became patients receiving pre-hospital assessment and emergency care from highly trained professionals. The ambulance attendant was replaced by the emergency medical technician, EMT. A current development in some areas is use of the term out-of-hospital care rather than pre-hospital care. As EMS personnel begin to provide primary care for some conditions and in some circumstances without transport to a hospital, figure 1-1, however, the term pre-hospital care will be used in the remainder of this text. Components of the EMS system To understand the EMS system, you must look at it from the patient's viewpoint rather than from that of the EMT, figure 1-2. For the patient, Care begins with the initial phone call to the emergency medical dispatcher, EMD, 
the EMS system responds to the call for help by sending to the scene available responders, including emergency medical responders, EMTs, and advanced life support providers, advanced EMTs, and paramedics. An ambulance will transport the patient to the hospital. From the ambulance, the patient is received by the emergency department. There, the patient receives laboratory tests, diagnosis, and further treatment. The emergency department serves as the gateway for the rest of the services offered by the hospital. If a patient is brought to the emergency department with serious injuries, care is given to stabilize the patient and the operating room is ready to provide further life-saving measures. Some hospitals handle all routine and emergency cases, but have a specialty that sets them apart from other hospitals. One specialty hospital is the trauma center. In some hospitals, a surgery team may not be available at all times. In a trauma center, surgery teams capable of the comprehensive treatment of trauma patients are available 24 hours a day. Core Concept the chain of human resources that forms the EMS system. In addition to trauma centers, there are also hospitals that specialize in the care of certain conditions and patients, such as burn centers, pediatric centers, cardiac centers, and stroke centers. As an EMT, you will become familiar with the hospital resources available in your area. Many EMS regions have specific criteria for transporting patients with special needs. Choosing the right hospital may actually be a life-saving decision. Of course, it is important to weigh the patient's condition against the additional transport time that may be required to take him to a specialized facility. Online medical direction, discussed later, may be available to help with this decision. Dispatchers and EMTs are key members of the pre-hospital EMS team. The levels of EMS training will be discussed later in the chapter. Many others make up the hospital portion of the EMS system. They include physicians, nurses, physician's assistants, respiratory and physical therapists, technicians, aides, and others. Accessing the EMS system. Most localities have a 911 system for telephone access to report emergencies. A dispatcher answers the call, takes the information, and alerts EMS or the fire or police departments as needed. Since the number 911 is designed to be a national emergency number, there will be a time when someone may dial 911 from any phone in the country and be connected to the appropriate emergency center. Many communication centers have enhanced 911. This system has the capability of automatically identifying the caller's phone number and location. If the phone is disconnected or the patient loses consciousness, the dispatcher will still be able to send emergency personnel to the scene. There are still a few communities that do not have 911 systems. In these locations, a standard seven-digit telephone number must be dialed to reach ambulance, fire, or police services. Dialing 911 where a 911 system is not in operation will usually connect the caller to an operator who will attempt to route the call to the appropriate dispatch center. This adds an extra step and extra time to the process, so it is important to make sure that the emergency numbers in use in a local area are prominently displayed on all telephones. Another development in the communication and dispatch portion of the EMS system is the training and certification of EMDs. These specially trained dispatchers not only obtain the appropriate information from callers, but they also provide medical instructions for emergency care. These include instructions for CPR, artificial ventilation, bleeding control, and more. Research has consistently pointed to the importance of early access and prompt initiation of emergency care and CPR. The EMD is one example of the EMS system providing emergency care at the earliest possible moment. Levels of EMS Training There are four general levels of EMS training and certification, described in the following list. These levels vary from place to place. Your instructor will explain any variations that may exist in your region or state. Core Concept how the public activates the EMS system. 911 system, a system for telephone access to report emergencies.
A dispatcher takes the information and alerts EMS or the fire or police departments as needed. Enhance 911 has the additional capability of automatically identifying the caller's phone number and location. Emergency Medical Responder, EMR, previously called First Responder. This level of training is designed for the person who is often first at the scene. Many police officers, firefighters, and industrial health personnel function in this capacity. The emphasis is on activating the EMS system and providing immediate care for life-threatening injuries, controlling the scene, and preparing for the arrival of the ambulance. Emergency Medical Technician, EMT, previously called EMT Basic. In most areas, the EMT is considered the minimum level of certification for ambulance personnel. EMTs provide basic level medical and trauma care and transportation to a medical facility. Advanced Emergency Medical Technician, AEMT, previously called EMT Intermediate. The AEMT, like the EMT, provides basic level care and transportation, as well as some advanced level care, including use of advanced airway devices, monitoring of blood glucose levels, and administration of some medications which may include intravenous and intraosseous administration. Paramedic, previously sometimes called EMT paramedic. The paramedic performs all of the skills of the EMT and AEMT plus advanced level skills. The paramedic provides the most advanced level of pre-hospital care. Critical decision making, a key concept. Critical decision-making is a very important concept. It essentially means that an EMT takes in information from the scene, the patient assessment, and other sources and makes appropriate decisions after synthesizing or interpreting all of the information. There are times when the information you obtain initially won't be enough to be a basis for decision-making, so you will need to ask more questions and perform additional examinations to get everything you need to make a decision. It may be difficult to see how this all fits together now. Before long, however, you'll be learning and practicing patient assessment and care. Some examples of critical decision-making that will be a part of the assessment and care you will perform include 1. Deciding which hospital to transport someone to. Should you take your patient to the closest hospital or to a more distant specialty hospital? 2. Deciding whether you should administer a medication to a patient. Will it help the patient's current condition? Could it make the condition worse? When you begin to work with more experienced EMTs, you will come across many who are smart and know what to do and how to treat patients, both clinically and personally. These are the EMTs you would want to take care of you or your family should EMS be needed. These EMTs are good critical decision makers. Roles and Responsibilities of the EMT As an EMT, you will be responsible for a wide range of activities. In addition to patient assessment and emergency care, your responsibilities will include preparation, a safe response to the scene, safe transportation to the hospital, and transferring the patient to hospital personnel for continuity of care. The following are specific areas of responsibility for the EMT. Personal Safety it is not possible to help a patient if you are injured before you reach him or while you are providing care, so your first responsibility is to keep yourself safe. Safety concerns include dangers from other human beings, animals, unstable buildings, fires, explosions, and more. Though emergency scenes are usually safe, they also can be unpredictable. You must take care at all times to stay safe. Safety of the crew, patient, and bystanders. The same dangers you face will also be faced by others at the scene. As a professional, you must be concerned with their safety as well as your own. Patient Assessment As an EMT, one of your most important functions will be assessment of your patient or finding out enough about what is wrong with your patient to be able to provide the appropriate emergency care. Assessment always precedes emergency care. Patient care. The actual care required for an individual patient may range from simple emotional support to life-saving CPR and defibrillation. Based on your assessment findings, 
Patient care is an action or series of actions that your training will prepare you to take in order to help the patient deal with and survive his illness or injury. Lifting and moving. Since EMTs are usually involved in transporting patients to the hospital, lifting and moving patients are important tasks. You must perform them without injury to yourself and without aggravating or adding to the patient's existing injuries. Transport. It is a serious responsibility to operate an ambulance at any time, but even more so when there is a patient on board. Safe operation of the ambulance, as well as securing and caring for the patient in the ambulance, will be important parts of your job as an EMT. Transfer of care. Upon arrival at the hospital, you will turn the patient over to hospital personnel. You will provide information on the patient's condition, your observations of the scene, and other pertinent data, so that there will be continuity in the patient's care. Although this part of patient care comes at the end of the call, it is very important. You must never abandon care of the patient at the hospital until transfer to hospital personnel has been properly completed. Patient advocacy. As an EMT, you are there for your patient. You are an advocate, the person who speaks up for your patient and pleads his cause. It is your responsibility to address the patient's needs and to bring any of his concerns to the attention of the hospital staff. You will have developed a rapport with the patient during your brief but very important time together, a rapport that gives you an understanding of his condition and needs. As an advocate, you will do your best to transmit this knowledge in order to help the patient continue through the EMS and hospital system. In your role as an advocate, you may perform a task as important as reporting information that will enable the hospital staff to save the patient's life, or as simple as making sure a relative of the patient is notified. Acts that may seem minor to you may often provide major comfort to your patient. EMTs may also be involved in community health initiatives, such as injury prevention. The EMT is in a position to observe situations where injuries are possible and help correct them before injuries or further injuries are sustained. Hospital personnel do not see the scene and cannot offer this information. An example might be a call to the residence of a senior citizen who has fallen. You make observations about improper railings or slippery throw rugs or shoes and bring this to the attention of the patient and his family. Another place where injury prevention may be beneficial is with children. If you respond to a residence where there are small children and you observe potential for injury, for example, poisons the child can access or unsafe conditions such as a loose railing, your interventions can make a difference. These community health issues are discussed throughout the book and can be found in Chapter 23, Poisoning and Overdose Emergencies, Chapter 35, Pediatric Emergencies, and Chapter 36, Geriatric Emergencies. Core Concept, Your Roles and Responsibilities as an EMT. Traits of a Good EMT Certain physical traits and aspects of personality are desirable for an EMT. Physical Traits Physically, you should be in good health and fit to carry out your duties. If you are unable to provide needed care because you cannot bend over or catch your breath, then all your training may be worthless to the patient who is in need of your help. You should be able to lift and carry up to 125 pounds. Practice with other EMTs is essential so that you can learn how to carry your share of the combined weight of the patient, stretcher, linens, blankets, and portable oxygen equipment. For such moves, coordination and dexterity are needed as well as strength. You will have to perform basic rescue procedures, lower stretchers, and patients from upper levels and negotiate fire escapes and stairways while carrying patients. Your eyesight is very important in performing your EMT duties. Make certain that you can clearly see distant objects as well as those close at hand. Both types of vision are needed for patient assessment, reading labels, controlling emergency scenes, and driving. Should you have any eyesight problems, they must be corrected with prescription eyeglasses or contact lenses. Be aware of any problems you may have with color vision. Not only is this important to driving, but it could also be critical for patient assessment.
Color of the patient's skin, lips, and nail beds often provides valuable clues to the patient's condition. You should be able to give and receive oral and written instructions and communicate with the patient, bystanders, and other members of the EMS system. Eyesight, hearing, and speech are important to the EMT. Thus, any significant problems must be corrected if you are going to be an EMT. Personal Traits Good personal traits are very important to the EMT. You should be pleasant to inspire confidence and help to calm the sick and injured, sincere to be able to convey an understanding of the situation and the patient's feelings, cooperative to allow for faster and better care, establish better coordination with other members of the EMS system, and bolster the confidence of patients and bystanders, resourceful, to be able to adapt a tool or technique to fit an unusual situation. A self-starter, to show initiative and accomplish what must be done without having to depend on someone else to start procedures. Emotionally stable, to help overcome the unpleasant aspects of an emergency so that needed care may be rendered and any uneasy feelings that exist afterward may be resolved. Able to lead, in order to take the steps necessary to control a scene, organize bystanders, deliver emergency care, and, when necessary, take charge. Neat and clean, to promote confidence in both patients and bystanders, and to reduce the possibility of contamination, figure 1-3. Of good moral character and respectful of others, to allow for trust in situations when the patient cannot protect his own body or valuables, and so that all information relayed is truthful and reliable in control of personal habits to reduce the possibility of rendering improper care and to prevent patient discomfort. This includes never consuming alcohol within eight hours of duty and not smoking when providing care. Remember, smoking can contaminate wounds and is dangerous around oxygen delivery systems. Controlled in conversation and able to communicate properly in order to inspire confidence and avoid inappropriate conversation that may upset or anger the patient or bystanders or violate patient confidentiality. Able to listen to others, to be compassionate and empathetic, to be accurate with interviews, and to inspire confidence. Non-judgmental and fair, treating all patients equally regardless of race, religion, or culture. There are many cultural differences you will encounter among patients. Figure 1-4 highlights one example of the cultures you may encounter in EMS. You will find additional features involving cultural issues throughout the book. Education An EMT must also maintain up-to-date knowledge and skills. Since ongoing research in emergency care causes occasional changes in procedure, some of the information you receive while you are studying to become an EMT will become outdated during your career. There are many ways to stay current. One way is through refresher training. Most areas require recertification at regular intervals. Refresher courses present material to the EMT who has already been through a full course but needs to receive updated information. Refresher courses, which are usually shorter than original courses, are required at two- to four-year intervals. Continuing education is another way to stay current. This type of training supplements the EMT's original course. It should not take the place of original training. For example, you may wish to learn more about pediatric or trauma skills or driving techniques. You can obtain this education in conferences and seminars and through lectures classes, videos, or demonstrations. It is important for you to realize that education is a constant process that extends long past your original EMT course. Where will you become a provider? As an EMT, you will have a wide variety of opportunities to use the skills you will learn in class. EMTs are employed in public and private settings such as fire departments, ambulance services, and rural, wilderness, or urban industrial settings, figure 1-5. In fact, many fire departments require their firefighters to be cross-trained as both firefighters and EMTs. You may be taking this course to volunteer. A large portion of the United States is served by volunteer fire and emergency medical services.
Your willingness to participate in training to help others is both necessary for and appreciated by your community. National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. The National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians (NREMT), as part of its effort to establish and maintain national standards for EMTs, provides registration to EMRs, EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics. Registration is obtained by successfully completing NREMT practical and computer-based knowledge examinations. Holding an NREMT registration may help in reciprocity, transferring to another state or region. It is usually considered favorably when you apply for employment, even in areas where NREMT registration is not required. Figure one six. Many states use the national registry examinations as their certification exams. If your state or region does not use the registry exam, ask your instructor how you can sit for the examination. Upon passing the exam and obtaining registry, you will be entitled to wear the NREMT patch. The national registry is also active in EMS curriculum development and other issues that affect EMS today. For information, contact National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, six six one zero Bush Boulevard, PO Box two nine two three three, Columbus, Ohio four three two two nine. Six one four eight 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 four four eight four, www dot nremt dot org. Quality improvement. Quality improvement, an important concept in EMS, consists of continuous self review with the purpose of identifying aspects of the system that require improvement. Once a problem is identified, a plan is developed and implemented to prevent further occurrences of the same problem. As implied by the name, quality improvement is designed and performed to ensure that the public receives the highest quality pre-hospital care. A sample quality improvement review might go as follows: as part of a continuous review of calls, the quality improvement (QI) committee has reviewed all of your squad's run reports that involve trauma during one particular month. The committee has noted that the time spent at the scene of serious trauma calls was excessive. You will learn later that time at the scene of serious trauma should be kept to a minimum because the injured patient must be transported to the hospital for care that cannot be provided in the field. Core concept: the process of EMS quality improvement (QI). Quality improvement: a process of continuous self-review with the purpose of identifying and correcting aspects of the system that require improvement. The QI committee has brought this fact to the attention of the medical director and the leadership of the ambulance squad. As a result, better protocols have been instituted. Monthly squad training is developed that covers topics such as how to identify serious trauma patients and then requires skill practice to reinforce techniques of trauma care. Later in the year, the QI committee will review the same criteria to ensure that the extra training has been effective in improving the areas that were found to be deficient. During the review, the QI committee has also identified calls during which the crews followed procedures and performed well. A letter has been sent to these EMTs commending them for their efforts. As an EMT, you will have a role in the quality improvement process. In fact. A dedication to quality can be one of the strongest assets of an EMT. There are several ways you can work toward quality care. These include preparing carefully written documentation. Call reviews are based on the pre-hospital care reports that you and other crew members write. If a report is incomplete, it is difficult for a QI team to assess the events of a call. If you are ever involved in a lawsuit. And、an accurate or incomplete report may also be a cause for liability. Be sure the reports you write are neat, complete, and accurate. Becoming involved in the quality process. As you gain experience, you may wish to volunteer for assignment to the QI committee. In addition, quality improvement has a place on every call. An individual ambulance crew can perform a critique after each call to determine things that went well and others that may need improvement.
Have another EMT or advanced EMT look over your report before turning it in to ensure that it is accurate and complete. Obtaining feedback from patients and the hospital staff. This may be done informally or, in some cases, formally. Your organization may send a letter to patients that asks for comments on the care they were given while under your care. Hospital staff may be able to provide information that will help strengthen your caregiving skills. Maintaining your equipment. It will be difficult to provide quality care with substandard, damaged, or missing equipment. Although the ingenuity of EMT should never be underestimated, it would be impossible to administer oxygen or provide cardiac defibrillation without proper functional equipment. Check and maintain equipment regularly. Continuing your education. An EMT who was certified several years ago and has never attended subsequent training will have a problem providing quality care. Seldom used skills deteriorate without practice. Procedures change. Without some form of regular continuing education, it will be difficult to maintain standards of quality. Quality improvement is another name for providing the care that you would want to have provided to you or loved one in a time of emergency. That is the best care possible. Maintaining continuous high quality is not easy. It requires constant attention and a sense of pride and obligation. Striving for quality, both in the care you personally give to patients and as a collective part of an ambulance squad, is to uphold the highest standards of the EMS system. Medical Direction Each EMS service or agency has a medical director a physician who assumes the ultimate responsibility for medical direction or oversight of the patient care aspects of the EMS system. The medical director also oversees training, develops protocols, lists of steps for assessment and interventions to be performed in different situations, and is a crucial part of the quality improvement process. An EMT at a basic or advanced level is operating as a designated agent of the physician. Medical Director A physician who assumes ultimate responsibility for the patient care aspects of the EMS system. Medical Direction Oversight of the patient care aspects of an EMS system by the Medical Director. Protocols Lists of steps such as assessments and interventions to be taken in different situations. Protocols are developed by the Medical Director of an EMS system. Point of View I was driving along, not a care in the world, when all of a sudden this car pulled out from a side street and pulled right in front of me. I couldn't brake in time. I couldn't steer in time. The crash made thunder seem like a whisper. I didn't just hear it. I felt it. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in my car, and it was smoky. I thought it was on fire. Then I noticed the airbag, which must have gone off. People were running up to my window to ask if I was okay. I felt so foggy. I didn't even know what to say. A fireman came up to my window and asked how I was doing. By then I had a minute to think and compose myself. It felt like I'd cry if I opened my mouth to say anything. The ambulance came in, and the EMTs and firefighters worked to get me out of the car. The fireman who came to my window must have climbed into the back seat. I could feel hands alongside my head. The collar felt like it was going to choke me. The board was uncomfortable, and everything was so, so loud. But what I remember most, more than the crash or the hospital or the bills, were the kind words the fireman said from behind me. In spite of everything going on that day, his reassuring, kind voice is my best memory from the whole miserable day. It was like an angel being there for me. As you begin your training as an EMT, you will learn many clinical skills. For this patient, you will perform an assessment immobilize the neck and spine, take vital signs, and transport the patient, perhaps to a trauma center. You will also provide emotional reassurance and support in this time of crisis. It has been said that you should treat your patients as you would want your family to be treated. This is a good rule. Point of view features like this one will appear throughout the text. Their purpose is to present an emergency from the patient's perspective, or point of view, because understanding how the patient feels is a critical element in developing people skills. The clinical skills you learn are vital to your success in becoming an EMT. However, people skills are essential for you to thrive as an EMT. 
This means that as an EMT, your authority to give medications and provide emergency care is actually an extension of the medical director's license to practice medicine. The physician obviously cannot physically be at every call. This is why EMS systems develop standing orders. The physician issues a policy or protocol that authorizes EMTs and others to perform particular skills in certain situations. An example may be the administration of glucose. Glucose is very beneficial to certain diabetic patients who are experiencing a medical emergency. The medical director issues a standing order that allows EMTs to give glucose in certain circumstances without speaking to the medical director or another physician. This kind of behind-the-scenes medical direction is called offline medical direction. Certain other procedures that are not covered by standing orders or protocols require the EMT to contact the on-duty physician by radio or telephone prior to performing a skill or administering a medication. For example, EMTs carry aspirin, which is beneficial to many but not all patients who have possible cardiac symptoms. Prior to administering aspirin, you may be required to consult with the on-duty physician. You would use a radio or cell phone from the ambulance to provide patient information to the physician. After receiving your information, the physician would instruct you on whether and how to administer the aspirin. Orders from the on-duty physician given by radio or phone are called online medical direction. Online medical direction may be requested at any time you feel that medical advice would be beneficial to patient care. Protocols and procedures for online and offline medical direction vary from system to system. Your instructor will inform you what your local policies are. Always follow your local protocols. Research Medicine is based on research. Some of the procedures you will be trained to perform have been developed as a result of research, but not all. If you believe this should be changed, you are not alone. Experts universally agree that research must play a greater role in EMS for it to continue to evolve as a respected profession. Many of the things we do are based on tradition, simply stated, because that is how we have always done them. Many other techniques were developed from hospital procedures and applied to the field. Although teaching how to perform or even interpret research is beyond the scope of your EMT class, it is important for you to know the importance of research and how it will shape the future of EMS. Two ways research impacts EMS is through a focus on improving patient outcomes and through evidence-based techniques. Although our concerns may seem to be whether patients make it to the hospital alive, we must remember that EMS is part of a larger system. What we do also affects the patient's long-term survival. If something appears to help in the short term but has no effect in the long term, it is not useful. This research into long-term results, patient outcomes, allows us to make the best decisions for the patient's overall care. Evidence-based decision-making means that the procedures and knowledge we use in determining what care works is based on scientific evidence. A scenario involving evidence-based decision-making might go like this. You are at the ambulance bay when an experienced member of your crew is talking with your medical director about adding a new medication to the EMT scope of practice. This member has heard that the new drug has been successful in other local squads and has seen it in magazines for EMS providers. Your medical director finds it interesting but asks the member for evidence. Check the literature, he says. If we can find evidence that this makes a difference in outcomes and doesn't have a significant risk, we'll take a look at it. The evidence-based process here demonstrates the general procedures needed to make these decisions. It includes forming a hypothesis. In this case, the experienced provider felt that a new medication would be safe to use and beneficial. Designated Agent an EMT or other person authorized by a medical director to give medications and provide emergency care. The transfer of such authorization to be a designated agent is an extension of the medical director's license to practice medicine. Standing Orders A policy or protocol issued by a medical director that authorizes EMTs and others to perform particular skills in certain situations. Offline Medical Direction 
Standing orders issued by the medical director that allow EMTs to give certain medications or perform certain procedures without speaking to the medical director or another physician. Online medical direction. Orders given directly by the on-duty physician to an EMT in the field by radio or telephone. Patient outcomes. The long-term survival of patients. Evidence-based. Description of medical techniques or practices that are supported by scientific evidence of their safety and efficacy, rather than merely on supposition and tradition. Reviewing literature. The provider goes to the local college library and searches medical literature to determine if the new medication has been studied, especially for use by EMTs. Figure 1-7. Evaluating the evidence. The provider meets with the medical director to review the literature. If there was no literature, they could decide to create a research project to study it in the organization or region. Adopting the practice if evidence supports it. It turns out that the medication has been studied and appears safe. The medical director is convinced that the medication should be brought into the EMT scope of practice. Training sessions are scheduled prior to implementation. The EMS role in public health. From clean drinking water and sewage systems to the decline of infectious diseases through vaccination, we have reaped the benefits of public health. Although public health has many definitions, it is considered the system by which the medical community oversees the basic health of a population. Additional efforts by the public health system include prenatal care, reducing injury in children and geriatric patients, and campaigns to reduce the use of tobacco. EMS has a role in many public safety issues, including injury prevention for geriatric patients, when on calls to a patient's home, the EMT can identify things that may cause falls, such as footwear or rugs, figure 1-8. EMS may also run blood pressure clinics and offer methods for the elderly to present medications and medical history to EMTs in the event of emergency. For example, file of life. Injury prevention for youth. EMS is frequently involved in child safety seat clinics, distribution of bicycle helmets, and other programs for youth. Public vaccination programs. More and more EMS providers are being trained and allowed to provide vaccination clinics for the public. Seasonal flu and variations such as H1N1 are examples of vaccinations that are frequently offered by EMS providers. Some regions are beginning to allow specially trained EMS providers to take routine vaccinations for example, routine childhood vaccinations, out to the public, especially in areas where many children do not have routine, well care, and are at risk. Disease surveillance. At the front lines, EMS reports may serve as an indication that a trend in injury or disease is beginning. This may range from flu to violence to terrorist attacks. Programs are developing around the country that utilize EMS providers in different and innovative public health roles. Unlike hospital or office-based medicine, EMS is always in the field, in patients' homes, and in the public eye. This visibility and access is vital to getting health services at the point they are needed and to identify areas where injuries and disease may be prevented. One thing is certain, EMS does more than just respond to emergencies. In your future as an EMT, you will likely take an even greater role in public health. Special Issues EMTs are people, and people make mistakes. You may have seen in your local news about errors that have occurred in the hospital and have resulted in lawsuits. All of medicine, including EMS, recognizes this as a serious issue. Chapter 4, Medical, Legal, and Ethical Issues, will cover this topic in detail. In the coming weeks and through the chapters that follow in this textbook, you will be studying to become an EMT. As part of your course, your instructor will advise you on local issues and administrative matters such as a course description, class meeting times, and criteria including physical and mental requirements for certification as an EMT, as well as specific statutes and regulations regarding EMS in your state, region, or locality. The Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, has set strict guidelines preserving the rights of Americans with disabilities. If you have a disability or have questions about the ADA, 
Ask your instructor for more information. Chapter Review Key Facts and Concepts The EMS system has been developed to provide pre-hospital as well as hospital emergency care. The EMS system includes 911 or another emergency access system, dispatchers, EMTs, the hospital emergency department, physicians, nurses, physician's assistants, and other health professionals. The EMT's responsibilities include safety, patient assessment and care, lifting, moving, and transporting patients, transfer of care, and patient advocacy. An EMT must have certain personal and physical traits to ensure the ability to do the job. Education, including refresher training and continuing education, quality improvement procedures, and medical direction are all essential to maintaining high standards of EMS care. Key Decisions Making accurate decisions in patient care is the hallmark of a competent EMT. This feature will be used throughout this text to help you identify these important decisions and relate their importance in emergency care. Since this is a non-clinical chapter, picture yourself applying for a job or being interviewed for membership in a volunteer squad. How would you answer the following questions asked in the interview? Do you think EMS makes a difference? Why? If EMS is about helping people, how do you anticipate helping people as an EMT? Can EMS have a role in injury prevention or public health? How will EMS look in the future?